This study is rooted in the belief that if you can identify the capabilities, potential, and objectives of a system, then you can assess how well that system is suited to meet its goals. By capabilities, we mean what the system can do now. By potential, we mean what it could do if it were performing at its best. And by objectives, we mean what the system is trying to do. This idea led to the question, in the systems world, are there underlying archetypes that describe how a system uses its real and potential capabilities to achieve its objectives? If so, can these archetypes be used to measure a system's suitability to its environment and to its goals? By definition, an archetype is a form or image that recurs across both time and cultural boundaries and has a similar meaning everywhere it occurs. Archetypes are the underlying mental images that each of us use to integrate objects, individuals, and events into our personal experience. The idea of archetypes is not a foreign concept in the domain of system science. Many different classifications and models have been developed that are specifically designed to discriminate between systems based on their structures, behaviors, or capabilities. Each of these approaches has its own benefits and limitations. The first of these classification systems comes from Peter Singe, who devised the system dynamics archetypes. His models focus on causal loops within a system that either balance or reinforce a course of action. Most of his research was directed towards organizational management and different ways that leverage could be applied within an organization to correct undesirable behavior. He and his peers developed nearly a dozen archetypes based on common patterns of behavior within systems and the effects that they have over time. Critics of these archetypes claim that because they're derived from the world of system dynamics, they don't have a strong foundation in systems theory. More significantly, though, the system dynamics archetypes require an in-depth understanding of causal modeling to understand or implement. Critics claim that as problems become more complex, only modeling experts are able to use or interpret these tools. The next classification system is Kenneth Boulding's Skeleton of Science, which is firmly rooted in system theory. Boulding's catalog of system types starts with simple clockworks and then extends to social organizations and transcendental systems. His framework is comprehensive and it provides a bin that will accommodate virtually any type of system. Still, Boulding's framework is a strict hierarchy that is, for the most part, based on complexity. This means that most systems will only fit into one category, and once there, they can't easily be moved. Further, because Boulding's catalog is a hierarchy, it provides no way to distinguish between different types of systems in the same level. Other system classifications come from the work of Akoff and Garajadagi and Dante Martinelli. The Akoff catalog is a set of four classes that separate systems based on the level of self-determination or purposefulness that they exhibit. Martinelli's classifications are more reminiscent of Boulding's and they focus on the nature of interactions that occur inside the system. Because they are strict hierarchies, these approaches have the same limitations that exist in Boulding's skeleton of science. A system cannot move between categories without fundamentally changing its identity, and there is no way to differentiate between systems in the same category. Management cybernetics, which is based on the viable systems model, does not attempt to classify the systems as a whole. Instead, it separates the operations within a system into a collection of layers that are all required for the system to remain viable. The viable systems model has been broadly applied across many organizational structures and has proven to be a successful and resilient management tool. Still, Beer's model is different from the others because it does not distinguish between types of systems and it doesn't provide insight into how well suited a system is for a particular mission. Also, as pointed out by Anya Reisberg, while the viable systems model is very helpful in identifying problems, it does not provide prescriptive solutions for correcting them. By examining the classification systems and archetypes currently associated with system theory, we have identified a number of limitations that can be addressed by this research. Therefore, the purpose of this research is to discover, identify, and document a collection of primitive system archetypes which define how we interpret the systems around us. 
Following the Jungian definition, the system archetypes will be primitive, underlying imagery that recurs across both time and cultural boundaries and has a similar meaning everywhere it's seen. The research purpose is addressed through two research questions. First, what complex system archetypes emerge from a structured examination of the principles of systems theory? And secondly, what happens when these archetypes are applied to a system in a case study? For this research, the case study focused on a facilities management department in a large industrial organization. The significant original contributions from this research are theoretical, methodological, and practical. The theoretical contribution is represented by the collection of system archetypes that were produced as part of the study. This research also generated a library of relational models of system principles that can be used and extended by other researchers. The methodological contribution, which has perhaps the most far-reaching implications, is the development and documentation of a visual approach to grounded theory, which couples object modeling techniques with the grounded approach to research pioneered by Glazer and Strauss. Finally, the practical contribution of these archetypes lies in their future application within the domain of complex systems governance, system diagnostics, and the examination of a system under study. In approaching the problem, the research design was guided by the principles of grounded theory. The research data came from the literature, and the literature search targeted the collected principles of system theory documented by Adams et al. Each system principle was examined and dissected in search of underlying relationships. The following questions guided the exploration. Is the property a characteristic of all systems? Can the property vary in state or condition? Is the property transformational, meaning if it changes, it alters the identity of the system? Is the property transitional, meaning if it changes, it alters the behavior of the system, but not the system's identity? Do dependencies exist between this and other properties? Does this characteristic contradict others? If so, how are these contradictions resolved? As the collection of system principles were evaluated, relationships were compiled into a collection of visual models. Each model documents the originator of the concept, as well as its heredity, its progeny, related and contributing concepts, and in some cases, its contradictors. In this example, you see the model for holism, which shows that it derives from Aristotle's concept of wholeness, it directly contributes to emergence, and that it has implications for the principle of self-organization. Notably, holism also serves to contradict the concepts of reductionism and determinism. As a final step in the research, a case study was performed that examined a sample system and attempted to identify which of the complex system archetypes could be found there. As discussed earlier, the case study focused on a facilities management department and the individual work groups that it contains. At this point, we'll move from the research design to the execution and findings. The diagram shown here contains the collection of system principles developed by Adams, Hester, Bradley, Myers, and Keating. Each principle is represented by a hexagonal block, and the principles are grouped together into axioms that define the relationship that exists between them. Because this research did not want to necessarily be bound by the existing relationships, we have ignored the axiomatic groupings and have elected to focus only on the principles themselves. To illustrate how the visual coding approach works, we'll examine the principle of feedback. We begin by identifying the literature where the concept originated or was significantly developed. Depending on the amount of research in the subject area, it's easy to become overwhelmed by reference material. Because of this, the researcher may need to exercise some restraint in selecting the material to be included. As with all grounded theory, the key quotes and statements from each work must be identified and documented. These are included in Appendix A of this study. The next step in model development is to identify the principle's heredity, the earlier ideas that contributed to its development. In this case, Feedback inherits from Maxwell's research on governors, which inherits from Airy's study of regulators. There are, of course, other, even earlier contributors, but they're not included because they don't provide any additional insight into the main concept. Also, you can see that in some cases there are references included on the connecting line. These are used if the relationship between the two concepts was established by a third party. 
The next step is to identify other principles that are associated with the main concept. They might be related system principles or concepts that provide a pathway to other system principles or even ideas that are pertinent and contribute meaning to the main concept. The process of exploration continues with secondary and tertiary relationships as long as they continue to bear new fruit. Saturation is achieved when new, related concepts no longer lead back to system principles or when all of the end nodes are composed of system concepts that will be examined separately. The visual coding approach is repeated for each of the system principles that were included in the catalog. Further, as other principles gain in prominence and begin to make recurrent appearances in other models, they're promoted and are themselves examined as independent system principles. Examples of promoted principles include self-regulation, adaptation, and negative entropy. Of course, as you can see from this collection of models, the details of any specific principle are quickly lost in a forest of nodes and relationships. To address this, the next step is to create an abstraction one layer above this model that allows the collection of principles to be examined as a whole. The specific details of each principle are set aside for a moment in favor of a relationship-centric view of the concepts. Here, the principles are visually reorganized to allow the relationships between primary concepts to be seen and distinguished. Next, the secondary and tertiary concepts are added. These are the concepts that contribute to our understanding of the primary concept or that provide connections between principles. With these in place, we can see a completed model showing the relationships that exist between all system principles. This model allows us to examine the relationships quantitatively. Here, the key concepts are revealed, those having eight or more connections to other primary principles. The principles shown in green are also significant and have five or more connections to other primary principles. By examining this collection of principles and grouping them into related categories, we arrive at the goal of the grounded theory study, what Helen Scott called an explanation of the main concern of the substantive area. For this study, the main concern of system theory is the functions and mechanisms that systems employ to overcome conditions in pursuit of an end state. Using this thesis as a starting point, it follows that a collection of complex system archetypes should exist that represent how systems interact with the environment, cope with emergence and change, and remain viable. These are the archetypes that emerged from that perspective. It should be noted that this is not the only vantage point from which this data can be viewed, and other archetypes might be generated from other perspectives. In examining the complex system archetypes, the first step is to understand the environment where they exist. This environment is characterized by two immutable factors, the arrow of time, which points from the past to the future, and the arrow of dissipation, which flows from maximum concentrated energy to maximum entropy. We'll begin with time. Our open systems exist on the edge of the temporal horizon, right at the point where the future transitions into the past. This point is the present, or now. From this point, the system is exposed to temporal variety. These are the conditions that occur over time, and they are manifested in a number of ways. Actual variety, which is characterized by change and emergence, are the things that actually happen. Potential variety, which are uncertain but foreseeable events in the future, represent the variety that hasn't happened to us yet, but could. We'll begin with an examination of change. Change is characterized by a regular, steady pattern of variety that is expected, even counted on. Seasonal changes, tides, day and night, are all prime examples of change. As this figure shows, we can perceive change long before it happens, and it generally follows a regular pattern with little variation. Emergence, on the other hand, is less regular. By most definitions, emergence is unforeseeable until it manifests itself, which means it cannot be predicted. This does not mean, however, that a system can't see an emerging condition until it crosses the temporal horizon and crashes into it. On the contrary, like a hurricane that materializes in the Atlantic, emergent variety can be detected and observed well before it impacts the system. Potential variety represents all of the things that could happen to our system that we can foresee. 
This is an important distinction because many open systems have to consider everything that could happen to them and then choose which concerns they'll spend energy to prepare for. This is a critical decision because the collection of things that will happen is very, very small compared to the collection of things that could happen. Next, we examine the open system from the perspective of energy. According to the rules of entropy, energy in the universe is continuously dissipating, and over time, we transform from an environment of highly concentrated energy and low entropy to one of maximum entropy. Closed systems are a microcosm of entropy because they start with a fixed amount of energy and then eventually run down. Open systems, on the other hand, are different. They're able to collect free energy from the environment, convert it, store it, and use it to remain viable. The process of negative entropy is a defining property of open systems. It is with these relationships in mind that we begin an examination of the archetypes, starting with the most fundamental, the endurant. Like all open systems, the endurant collects energy from the environment and uses it to stay as far from entropy as possible. Like an uninterruptible power supply, the endurant has a fixed internal configuration. It cannot change the type of energy it collects, it cannot increase its storage capacity, and it cannot alter the way it distributes energy. Its survival is based entirely on its ability to collect and use energy fast enough to repair itself and remain viable. When faced with variety, this archetype survives by relying on its stored energy and its own toughness. For small emergence and change, this approach is often effective. Still, the accumulated effects of small events and the impact of larger ones eventually take their toll. When this happens, the system is overwhelmed by entropy and descends into inviability. The endurant archetype is governed by the following system principles. First, autopoiesis. This allows the endurant to stave off entropy by regenerating and repairing its internal components and structure. While the endurant is not able to reorganize itself, it may still have redundant resources, circuits, or paths that allow it to tolerate damage until it can make repairs. Like all systems, the endurant is governed by the law of requisite variety, which states that in order to remain viable, a system must be able to absorb all of the variety that it encounters. The endurant is also governed by the principle of relaxation time. When this archetype is disturbed by variety, it has to have time to recover before more variety arrives or it will be overwhelmed. Finally, at the root of all these archetypes is the principle of viability. Viability represents the system's struggle within an antagonistic environment to survive and maintain a separate existence. The endurant archetype is represented by the following examples. First, stable operations. When a system is steadily operating and there is very little change or emergence, then it's possible for the system to function continuously by simply collecting and converting energy and using it to dispose of entropy. The next example is sudden emergence. As discussed earlier, emergence crosses the temporal horizon with little or no notice, and sometimes our systems don't learn about it until it crashes into them. When this happens, there is no time for the system to execute any of its higher level archetypical responses. It either survives the impact and then mounts a response, or it is destroyed. In these cases, the endurant capacity of a system is its only defense. Finally, Endurant behavior is the last resort for a system that has been overcome by variety. When a system encounters massive variety, it can respond by using all of its capabilities and techniques, but sometimes those aren't enough and the system is overwhelmed. In those cases, the only option left for the system is to try to wait it out and survive using its endurant capacity. Next is the regulator archetype. Like the endurant, this archetype has a fixed internal configuration, but it has the ability to adjust the set points of its components to compensate for changes in the environment. The regulator knows which components are most important, and it manages them in a hierarchy that is designed to give priority to the most critical parameters first. Accordingly, the regulator is driven by the system principle of homeostasis. It has automatic mechanisms that strive to maintain the stability of its key parameters, which are at the top of the hierarchy. 
Of equal importance, though, is the principle of heterostasis. This principle dictates that in order to keep one parameter stable, the system is required to alter the set points of others. This has some serious implications that we'll see in the following slide. The problem of heterostasis can be seen in this example. As external conditions begin to vary, the system takes steps to keep the highest priority variable as close to normal as possible. This optimizing approach, while very good for the one parameter, may force other parameters into critical ranges where they're likely to incur damage. By following strict optimization, the regulator may protect one parameter at the expense of the whole system. An alternative to optimizing is satisficing behavior. Here the system knows the tolerances of each of its parameters and rather than attempting to keep the key parameter as close to normal as possible, it allows it to drift into high, but still safe, territory. This approach allows the parameters lower in the hierarchy to stay closer to normal, incur less entropy, and potentially prolong the lifetime of the system as a whole. Eventually, though, the system will encounter variety that is beyond its ability to compensate. When this happens, the system can make adjustments to the best of its ability, but eventually it has to fall back on its endurance capacity and it will either survive the changing conditions or it will not. The regulator archetype is governed by the following system principles. Beyond homeostasis, heterostasis, and satisficing, which were already discussed, the regulator is dominated by the principle of hierarchy. This means that it is composed of entities that are themselves composed of smaller entities, and so on. In the regulator, each of these entities has its own set points and its own priority with regard to system viability. The presence of hierarchy allows the regulator to benefit from the principle of requisite hierarchy. This means that the mere presence of the hierarchical structure is enough to ease the burden of regulation. The regulation of the system is dependent on the principle of feedback, where the system monitors the effects of individual changes and then uses them to direct future actions. This endows the system with control over its internal settings and allows it to move its set points through conditions of stability and instability in order to maintain a target state. As with all other systems, the regulator is governed by the law of requisite variety and the principle of viability. The regulator archetype is common in biological systems and can be observed in the process of endothermic regulation, where animals use metabolic processes to maintain and regulate their body temperature. Another example is seen in osmoregulation. This is the process that biological systems use to regulate their water balance and keep their fluids from becoming too diluted or too concentrated. A simpler example of the regulator is automotive cruise control. In this example, the control system automatically adjusts the throttle to maintain a constant speed. Moving beyond the regulator archetype, we come to the organizer. The organizer has the capacity for self-organization. While the endurance and regulator have fixed internal structures, the organizer is able to alter its configuration to adapt to changing conditions and variety. This is an important distinction because it gives the organizer a capacity for adaptation, allowing it to alter its structure or functions to become better suited to the environment. These adaptations can be observed in a number of behaviors. The first of these is exploitation. Because it has an alterable configuration, the organizer can restructure itself to take advantage of opportunities to obtain energy or to perform other beneficial functions. When conditions are less favorable, the organizer again has the ability to change its configuration for defensive purposes. In this example, the organizer has arranged itself in a manner that minimizes exposure of the bulk of its components and limits damage to as small an area as possible. The decision of where the impact will be absorbed is likely based on the organizer's own hierarchy and priorities. Once the threat is passed, the system can reorganize into a guarding configuration where it's able to protect a damaged component while repairs are being performed. Some organizers also have the ability to operate in a distributed manner, where not all components are co-located. In those scenarios, the system may operate under the principle of redundancy of potential command, where decisions for the entire system are made from the location with the most pertinent information. 
The organizer archetype is governed by the following system principles. Most importantly, this archetype has the ability to self-organize, and it can change its internal configuration as necessary. It also has the ability to adapt to become better suited to its environment. Redundancy of potential command, which was discussed earlier, may also be manifested in the organizer. Because of the organizer's capacity for change, we also observe the effects of holism here. According to this principle, the whole system will exhibit characteristics, behaviors, and capabilities that are not observed in its individual components. The combined effects of adaptation and holism contribute to emergence, where we see unexpected, unpredictable phenomena occur in the whole system which are not observed in any of its parts. If the components of the organizer are functioning independently, this archetype may also benefit from the principle of minimal critical specification. This principle states that efficiencies can emerge if the subsystems are allowed to implement a solution in the manner they deem most appropriate. The organizer is also governed by the law of requisite variety and the principle of viability. Organizer behavior is exhibited in the following examples. Flocking. Flocks of birds, schools of fish, and swarms of insects are all examples of self-organizing systems. Here the animals move in a rapidly changing configuration without a centralized decision maker. Moving like a cloud, these systems circumvent and flow around obstacles as they travel toward their objective. Pedestrian traffic is another example of organizer behavior. When observed externally, the individuals moving through a crowd group themselves into patterns and flows that minimize collisions and support the emergence of lanes. All of this happens organically with little or no communication between the participants. Finally, Governance is an example of organizer behavior. Most forms of government originate as self-organized efforts to manage or control the affairs of the collective. Similarly, transformations between government types, both violent and peaceful, are also manifestations of organizer behavior. From the organizer, we move on to the migrator archetype. While the other archetypes have focused on absorbing, regulating, organizing, or conforming to variety, the migrator takes a different tack. It physically relocates to either avoid negative variety or to take advantage of more favorable conditions. When it encounters dangerous emergence or change, rather than attempting to absorb it, the migrator relocates. Wilmer referred to animals that exhibit this behavior as avoiders. The term migrator is better suited for our purposes, though, because, as you can see, the migrator not only moves to avoid hazardous conditions, it also relocates to take advantage of more favorable ones, often traversing dangerous territory to get there. This brings us to an important new challenge that is faced by the migrator, that of contextual variety. While temporal variety is represented by change and emergence that impacts the system over time, contextual variety is driven by the actions of the system itself. Contextual variety is the potential variety that exists all around us, waiting for us to encounter it. To illustrate this, imagine that our system is a red ball sitting in the middle of the rough terrain shown in this figure. If the system stays put, it is only subject to the variety that approaches it over time, temporal variety. If, however, our system decides to leave its resting place and move somewhere else, it will have to deal with whatever challenges it encounters on its journey. If, for instance, our system follows a path along the basin floor, then the contextual variety that it encounters is relatively minor. It will not be required to expend a great deal of energy, and the entropy that it's likely to incur will probably be very low. If, however, our system elects to travel on a path that is perpendicular to the basin, then the challenges that it faces are much more significant. Traversing this path will require a much greater expenditure of energy, and the system is likely to suffer from the experience. Of equal importance, failure is always an option. If the system selects a path that is too difficult, there's no guarantee that it'll be able to overcome the contextual variety and reach its objective. Of course, there are more than just two options. Every path offers its own challenges and benefits. 
Each path also has its own contextual variety that the system must overcome. Further, while there are an infinite number of straight line paths extending outward from the system's resting point, our migrator is not limited to a straight trajectory and may follow curved paths and loops that require it to overcome even more contextual variety. The migrator archetype is governed by the following system principles. First, the concept of basins of stability dictates that the migrator will be attracted to a resting position that offers stability with the least expenditure of energy. To move from one basin of stability to another, our system must expend effort. The concept of stability refers to the system's propensity to return to a state of equilibrium after it has been disturbed. Conversely, instability occurs when the system is perturbed and then continues in the direction of displacement or increased oscillation. The migrator also employs control to regulate its travel through the environment. Further, it uses feedback to adjust its course and power to remain on track. Within the migrator archetype, we see the principle of dynamic equilibrium at work. Unlike the regulator, which seeks to maintain the value of key parameters, the internal equilibrium set points of the migrator can permanently change based on conditions at its new location. The migrator is also governed by the principle of equifinality, which dictates that it may reach the same final condition from any number of different starting points. Conversely, the migrator may also experience multifinality, where, after starting from an initial position, it can end up in any number of different final positions depending on the conditions. The system is also governed by homeoresis, which suggests that a moving system is likely to return to the same path or flow over time. Finally, the migrator is subject to the law of requisite variety and the principle of viability. Migrator behavior can be observed in migratory birds, which travel from areas of low or decreasing resources to areas of high or increasing resources. It may also be seen in the behavior of animals that follow dramatic paths to escape from predators. An example of this is the springbuck, an African gazelle that leaps almost two meters in the air, changing direction on every leap to elude predators. The next in our collection of system archetypes is the insulator. Unlike the other archetypes which alter themselves or their location to contend with variety, the insulator protects itself from variety using external material. In doing so, the insulator effectively transfers the accumulation of entropy from itself to its insulation. Further, because the insulating material is not a part of the system, it can be discarded and replaced as it becomes damaged. Insulating behavior may be manifested in a number of ways. Shielding behavior occurs when the system uses external, extrasystemic material to block the impact of variety. Here the shield receives the impact, but the system remains largely unaffected. The archetype may also use external material as insulation in the traditional sense. In this case, the system wraps itself in the insulating material to create a tolerable environment on the inside despite the impacts of emergence and change that are occurring outside. Another type of insulating behavior is filtering. Like sunblock, the insulator archetype uses external material to filter or minimize the effect of external variety, bringing it to a safe or even beneficial level without completely eliminating it. The insulator is characterized by the following system principles. We'll begin with allopoiesis where autopoiesis is the process by which systems rebuild and regenerate themselves, allopoiesis refers to the system's ability to construct things outside of itself. For example, the system's external insulation. Allostasis is also seen in the insulator archetype. Here the insulator survives by predicting the risks that will occur in the future and proactively taking steps to insulate against them. The law of requisite variety is another governing principle of the insulator. However, in the case of this archetype, the insulator survives by transferring the responsibility for absorbing variety from itself to an external entity. Likewise, it pursues viability by allowing the effects of entropy to accumulate in its external insulation, which can be replaced as necessary. 
Examples of insulator behavior include hibernation, where an animal seeks shelter in a cave or other structure that provides protection from weather and predators. Estivation, a form of summer hibernation, occurs when some animals burrow deep into damp soil to protect themselves from heat and dehydration. Perhaps one of the best examples of an insulator, though, is the hermit crab. Unable to produce its own shell, the hermit crab will co-opt virtually any container that is large enough to house its body. When the shell is damaged or outgrown, the hermit crab abandons it in favor of a new one. The last of the complex system archetypes is the manipulator. Where the other archetypes have endeavored to tolerate or endure the variety they encounter, the manipulator attempts to eliminate it. To accomplish this, the manipulator alters the environment so that the impact of emergence and change are minimized. It can do this in a number of ways. First, rather than moving to take advantage of energy sources, the manipulator can alter the environment to divert resources to itself. Further, when the manipulator is approached by change and emergence, rather than merely absorbing it, this archetype attempts to eliminate variety before it reaches the system. While there are similarities between the protective barrier created by the insulator and the modified environment produced by the manipulator, a crucial difference is in the size and scope of the effect. The insulator does not alter the variety, it merely shields the system from its effect. The manipulator effectively changes the variety's path or magnitude to minimize its effect. The system principles that are exhibited by the manipulator include Gaia theory. This is the concept suggested by James Lovelock, where the interactions between organisms and their inorganic surroundings maintains the conditions necessary for life on Earth. Along those same lines, Echopoiesis extends Lovelock's concept to theorize that a self-sustaining ecosystem might be fabricated on a lifeless, sterile planet. Morphogenesis is the system principle which states that evolutionary changes occur because of deviation amplifying relationships that exist between the system and its environment. This is closely related to the principle of punctuated equilibrium, the proposition that organisms and species exhibit very little evolutionary change over time, but when a significant change does happen, it is both rapid and dramatic. Purposeful behavior is another important concept for the manipulator. This principle states that the actions of a system are not happenstance, but are undertaken with the purpose of achieving a goal or end state. Another concept that emerges with the manipulator archetype is the principle of anthropization. Here humans make deliberate choices that result in changing conditions, and the environment adapts to compensate for those changes. This is the exact opposite of the normal relationship where the environment changes and the organisms are required to adapt. Of course, the manipulator is also governed by the law of requisite variety and the principle of viability. Examples of manipulator behavior include agricultural irrigation, where water is diverted from other sources to support agriculture and settlements. Notably, such environmental changes often have a profound and sometimes negative impact on other species. Road systems are another example of manipulator behavior. These artificial paths facilitate human migration and evacuation. Further, they provide a logistical route for delivering food and supplies to geographically separate areas. Finally, ecosystem engineers are another example of manipulators. These are animals, like the American beaver shown here, that alter the environment for their own benefit. So far, we've discussed each of the complex system archetypes independently, but there are some observations to be made by examining them as a continuum. First, an inverse relationship between energy consumption and entropy accumulation is suggested. At the far left of the spectrum, the endurant and regulator tend to require very little energy to perform their functions. They merely attempt to absorb all of the variety that they encounter until they are overcome by entropy. Moving right along the continuum, the archetypes increasingly use energy to adapt, move, or protect themselves from variety. They effectively spend energy to minimize entropy. At the most extreme end of the spectrum is the manipulator. The changes that it makes to the environment are potentially the most expensive in terms of energy, but 
If they're effective, they all but block the effects of variety, at least for a while. Another observation that can be made is the relationship between allomorphosis and automorphosis along this continuum. For the purpose of this study, allomorphosis refers to the system's inclination to change things outside of itself, while automorphosis describes the system's tendency to change its own configuration or set points. On the left end of the continuum are the endurant and the regulator, which have no capacity to intentionally alter their environment. Their only mechanisms for survival exist in self-repair or in altering their internal set points to compensate for variety. Moving to the organizer archetype, we find that while this system does alter its own configuration to deal with variety, it also adapts, and in doing so, adds something new to its environment. Likewise, the migrator alters the environment by removing itself from one location and installing itself at another. The insulator's effect on the environment is even more dramatic as it collects and integrates materials for its own use, often without making any changes to its systemic settings. Finally, the manipulator by definition alters the environment with the objective, through the principle of viability, of maintaining itself as long as possible. Having identified and described the complex system archetypes, the next step was to conduct a case study where they were applied in a real-world setting. For that purpose, I examined a facilities management department within an industrial facility. The results of the case study are included in Appendix B of this dissertation. In short, the study demonstrates that complex system archetypes are rarely found alone within a system and that most systems and subsystems manifest more than one archetypical behavior. The dominant behavior is dependent on the conditions that exist within the system and within its surrounding environment. Of equal importance, though, the case study shows that a system can alter its behavior to employ different archetypical features, which may give it an advantage in dealing with changing conditions. The implications of the completed research are as follows. From a theoretical perspective, this research generated a continuum of six complex system archetypes, the endurant, regulator, organizer, migrator, insulator, and manipulator. It also produced a collection of system models that document the origin, provenance, and interrelations of the system theory principles. From a methodological standpoint, this study defined a new approach for conducting grounded theory research by using a visual, model-based technique. Finally, in the domain of practical contributions, these archetypes provide a new instrument that can be added to the complex system governance toolbox. By using the system archetypes, practitioners can assess the capabilities, limitations, and potentials of their systems by determining where they fit within its continuum. Future research will focus on developing a metaphorical model or representation of these archetypes that make them more approachable and applicable by practitioners. Systems analysis tools can be developed that support practitioners in determining which archetypes are manifested in their systems and how they might be employed to improve performance. Finally, these archetypes can be used to develop a diagnostic tool for identifying pathologies that exist within our systems and determining potential paths to treatment.